Hi, my name is Thais Gibson, and I'm the co-owner and creator of the Personal Development School. This is your Daily Breakthrough video, and in this video, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about specifically how the fearful avoidant tends to respond to no contact if they've done the breaking up with the anxious preoccupied attachment style, and the anxious is the one doing the no contact, okay? So... Um, this has been something I've been requested all the time. I want you guys to know I'm seeing the comments. I see that you guys want videos about trust and how to rebuild trust. And I will definitely do a video about that. And I'm also going to continue the series of two dismissive avoidance in a relationship together and how that even happens and how it can work to anxious, etc. So I'm still going to do all that stuff. Um, I just had an enormous amount of requests around this today specifically. So I figured I'd put this out here and just sort of change up the series and, and what we're putting out every day. But all those things are still very high on the to-do list. So um, on the video to-do list, I guess. So um, first and foremost, everybody responds differently to no contact based on different timelines relative to how they heal from a breakup and also relative to what stage of the relationship they're in in the dating life cycle. And I often talk about on this channel how there are different stages to relationships. We have our dating stage, our honeymoon, our power struggle, our stability, commitment, and then bliss. And dependent on what stage we're in is definitely going to impact how a breakup takes place. So I have that outlined completely and we go through it in a lot of detail in the how to heal from a breakup course, which is out in the school um, for April. But um, you know, for the sake of this here, I'm just going to stay focused on the content. And if you have further questions about that or the relationship stages, I've done other videos around that. And you can also leave your questions in the comments below. Um, and also, as I dive into this today, I want you guys to know I'm doing everything I can to support our community right now as much as possible. We added like a third webinar to um, our members lounge inside of our school, and we have mastermind group sessions and breakout sessions and all these things to deal with connection and not feeling isolated and doing work together. And um, we're doing a stay-at-home sale. So we're doing 25% off of membership bundles, three months, six months, 12 month bundles. And... Um, and we probably just, this will be what we'll do during COVID, but we probably won't do like a 25% thing again. And if you're struggling with any um, financial issues, you can also reach out to my team at info at personaldevelopmentschool.com if you really need connection and support and want to work on yourself. And like, there's really no better time to do work on yourself than literally right now. So um, if you want to reach out and connect and ask questions, share your story, we definitely are offering scholarships and support and all these different things in any way that we can. And if there's anything else you need from me at this time, I am reading your comments. I'm going to make videos according to the comments and you can feel free to just express or communicate any needs you have for support or anything like that in the meantime. So, um, how does the anxious, how does the fearful respond to the anxious going no contact? Well, first and foremost, when we go no contact, number one, like it is very hard for the anxious preoccupied to do no contact. So I just want to validate that. Like if you're struggling with that and you're having a tough time and it's difficult, that's okay. Like you should, you should feel that way. And here's why. When an anxious individual goes through a breakup, they are experiencing the pain of the breakup, plus all the stored unresolved feelings to do with separation, separation anxiety, abandonment, feeling alone, that is that are stored in your mind. So you can think of like the an experience externally as triggering something where your subconscious mind has to open its filing cabinet and go in there and like take a deep dive and try to understand what's happening beneath the surface. So if for, if for example, um, you have had lots of anxiety in terms of your attachment relationships in childhood, like your caregivers are very there and very supportive and then they tend to um, move away a lot and, and take space because maybe they're working a lot or they've got things going on in their lives. And if you're a child and you didn't get this opportunity to like, like have that happen consistently enough where you learn to self-soothe or have that connection happen in a positive way enough where you built this like ability to believe that your own needs and feelings are worthy of being expressed and will be heard. Then what happens is all every single time there's this disconnect between yourself and a caregiver in childhood, your subconscious mind fears abandonment, fears being alone, fears that it won't be safe. And it's repetition plus emotion. It's all those little emotional charges that are consistent over time that actually create some of the deepest programming in the subconscious. So chances are you've got this sort of like big set of files, essentially, to use the analogy, around abandonment and anxiety and not being safe when there is abandonment. And so when you have a breakup now in your adult life, 
all of these files are being brought to the surface. It's like your conscious mind is like, oh, a breakup, a separation, a, a distancing, a disconnection. What do we know about that? And it goes into the subconscious filing cabinet and all this stuff floods to the surface. So basically when you are going through a breakup, you experience the pain of w- what the breakup is right now, plus all the subconscious unresolved pain that's happened from your past experiences. Now this can be reprogrammed and I hope you understand that. Like that doesn't, you don't have to feel like that forever. That is changeable. Um, but when you're going through the breakup and you haven't had the opportunity to do that, it's really, really challenging. So it's, it's okay that you feel that way first and foremost, and there are things you can do about it. And, and, um, for the sake of staying on track in this video, um, what I want you to understand is that when that passes as that sort of turns a corner, because sometimes, you know, eventually the filing cabinet closes and those things get there. You still have to dig them up and resolve them and reprogram them in order to prevent them from coming back long-term. But as that changes, obviously no contact will be a little bit easier to do. Okay. So during this time where it is challenging, your goal and your intentions, you really want them to be to, to self-soothe. Even if you're not going to do reprogramming and all that deep work, just practice self-soothing. And I like to think of, um, you know, the anxious is the anxious attachments relationship to themselves as being like, you know, you feel the way about the relationship to yourself at a subconscious level, similarly to how you would feel if you were dating somebody for five years and then they just like, they went off. Maybe they had to go on this like work trip and they're gone for six months and you expect to like talk to them consistently and they instead just go missing. And then they come back at the end of six months and they're like, Hey, I want to start the relationship again. Let's just pick up from where we left off. You know, you're going to have this like natural discomfort with that person first. And you're going to have to like reestablish trust and get to know the person all over again and understand what happened in that six months and dive in and maybe even do some forgiveness work around that with that person. And understand what your boundaries are and what you need from them. And like, you're going to have to do some work there. And you can think of that as representing the relationship you have to yourself, right? It's like, you can be so disconnected from yourself and your feelings and your needs and your boundaries and the expression of them and not losing yourself in other relationships around you. And so when you have gone missing from yourself for a period of time, Part of why it's so difficult to self-soothe at the beginning is because it's like saying you want that person to come back after six months of not talking and you're like, what happened? Where did you go? And you expect that that person's going to be able to soothe you like that. You're not, they're not. It's going to take a little bit of time for that connection to be reestablished, that trust to be reestablished. And maybe with that six months person gone missing, it's not a healthy thing, but in the relationship to yourself, it will, it will always be a healthy thing to reestablish that trust and that connection. And it's once you have that trust and connection in your own ability to like feel your feelings, listen to your feelings, use them to identify your needs and intentionally get those needs met through yourself first and show up in those areas of your life. And once you've built that trust in the relationship to yourself over time, self-soothing becomes natural and normal and quite easy. But it's when we don't know how to do that and we don't trust ourselves to do it, that sometimes I see anxious get frustrated. Like, why can't I self-soothe immediately? And, And the answer is because you have to build that up. You have to build that trust up. You have to know what to do. You have to build that trust that you can meet your own needs. And sometimes your subconscious mind doesn't trust parts of you. And it's it's not your fault that, okay, I just want to make sure the microphone is on. It's not your fault that um, there's been a struggle there. It's just that you weren't taught those things and your subconscious got patterned in with certain programs that said, we soothe through others and always look externally. But that's such important work that you have to do in order to be able to emotionally regulate when things do come up, when challenges do happen. Part of you becoming secure means rebuilding a relationship to yourself, digging deep into yourself, understanding, having insights, awarenesses, building trust, building connection, listening to your feelings, setting boundaries, all these extremely important things that we need as human beings to be able to navigate our lives effectively and every relationship effectively, like literally to have thriving relationships, you need to be somewhat masterful at those things. So, so think of a breakup going back to, I sort of went on a tangent there, but think of a breakup as like when you go through this challenge or this disconnect, it's like a really important opportunity for you to go inwards and start doing this work in the relationship to yourself. And it might be discomfort. It might be uncomfortable at the beginning or frustrating, but it's really important to build and start trusting and trying to do that work for yourself. Now, 
in reference to how this impacts the dismiss or the fearful avoidant, they start to wonder, usually if they've done the breaking up with you, they start to wonder about like where you're at and what you're feeling around three weeks. And it's really around the three to four week mark that they start to be open and like maybe have some regret or some remorse and start to want this like connection again and usually miss you if you've gone no contact. And the reason no contact can be really effective is because it, it, it magnifies those doubts. Everybody has doubts when they break up in a relationship. Everybody wonders like, oh, what if we did this? Or what if it's normal? It's the brain like detaching and going through some of the grieving process. But um, we feel those things more if we have to sit with them. If we don't feel like that person's there, you know, we're not taking them for granted. We're not like, oh, they're there. If we do want to get back together, we're like actually having to look at the, the magnitude of our decision. And so it can really impact and, and they can really be feeling these things at that point. Now I say this in every no contact video and I just want to like super put this out here again. Um, if this is you experiencing this, is this, a, this is what you're going through. It is so important that if you're trying to do no contact, it's not like this manipulation strategy to get somebody back. Because if you do it that way, it's never going to work anyways. Even if your relationship works, it's not going to be any healthier. You have to do this because you're able to set boundaries for yourself. You're going to let that person sit with their decision and really think about it. And if they decide, oh my gosh, I want to make this work and they want to show up and they want to be like, I'm here to, to work on this with you and do things together. And let's dive into some of the patterns that weren't working and let's talk through things and let's talk about our expectations and our needs. Like if somebody wants to show up with you and you've given them that space to think about it and decide if they want to show up that way, that's beautiful. And you have to be clear during your no contact time, what you would need if the person does return, what you would need in order to um, reestablish that connection in order to really work things out together. Right. So, so you want to make sure you have your boundaries set up. You want to make sure you have your intention set up for no contact. And you're really clear about that. And through doing that, you will see positive outcomes from doing this. Okay. If you're just using this as like, you're just hyper-focusing on the other person, you're not working on yourself. You're just like waiting for them to come back and wondering and all these different things. And then like hoping that the strategy works and just trying to willpower your way through it. You're not doing any favors for yourself. So I hope that that's, you know, really clear. Now I will say one other thing. I would say in the relationship dynamic between a fearful avoidant and anxious preoccupied, no contact in terms of how the two get back together and reconcile or not actually tends to work the most in this dynamic. If it's the anxious doing no contact with the fearful, why? Because fearful avoidance tend to make the, the most emotionally based decisions and often tend to deactivate most strongly. I was talking about this earlier in a webinar I was doing today and you know, if you take a, let's just say as an example, if you take a dismissive and a fearful avoidant together, yes, the dismissive is going to naturally consistently deactivate more in the relationship. But if there's a problem or the fearful avoidance triggered, or there's a challenge, the fearful avoidant will deactivate more strongly than the dismissive avoidant pretty much ever will. They'll be like, I can't be in the relationship and love such extremely doubtful thoughts. And the reason for this is because the fearful avoidance tend to have like more major triggers in terms of trauma responses. And so the more like trauma we have stored subconsciously, the stronger our fight or flight response becomes, or we could also say our freeze or fawn response becomes. So the, the more stuff that's stored there, the more strongly it comes out. And so it's not uncommon that the fearful avoidant, when there was somebody anxious, if they're having their deactivating side come up, they might be really strong and they might make these more emotionally based decisions, think that they're right at the time, come out of that sort of like trance-like state of being in that trauma space in their minds because their subconscious is flooding all this stuff to the surface and then be like, what if I did the wrong thing? And so again, if you are the anxious individual, and you're wanting this to work out with your fearful avoidant, you have to make sure you're clear in your boundaries, the fearful avoidance ready to do the work, they're open, and that you can participate together in creating something more healthy and thriving. And if you do that, then there's a really great chance that this works in a healthy way for both of you. And if you, um, if they don't respect boundaries or they're not willing to do the work, or if you're making the intention about just getting the relationship back and not about you healing, you self-soothing, you growing and expanding and making sure that you have boundaries so the other person can, person can do the same, then it's going to be a lot more challenging. So I hope this is useful information. Please like and share and subscribe to this channel if you're getting a lot of value out of it and just to be a part of our community. Also, I'm sometimes doing like live webinars through YouTube. So if you hit the notification bell, you'll also see when those things happen. Um, so 
Thank you for being here and I will see you in the next video.